Hello, welcome to the gallery here at Red Cat in Los Angeles. My name is Michael Worthington. I teach in the graphic design program at CalArts. And I'm also the curator of this show, Inside Out and Upside Down, posters from CalArts 1970 to 2019, in collaboration with Tashika Arsino Sutton and Silas Monroe. The exhibition design was developed through a collaborative process, working with a group of MFA students at CalArts. The structure centers around a metaphor of CalArts as its own cultural ecosystem, with the sections of the exhibition reflecting that. The gallery contains wooden trees with posters hanging from their branches, and solid bush-like structures are scattered throughout the central space. Hanging from the ceiling is a cloud of floating posters designed for events at Red Cat. The viewer can walk through these. The archive was started by faculty members Carrie Aramoto Mercer and Shelley Stepp following the Northridge earthquake of 1993. Carrie and Shelley felt a sense of loss after the earthquake, and they started to work to preserve the posters, those most ephemeral pieces of culture. The archive built slowly over the next two decades into an important repository for graphic design, and also it became a visible history of events that had happened at CalArts. In 2015, the graphic design program created an online database of the posters. This involved shooting all of the posters, putting the images up online, and crowdsourcing missing information. The program also created a physical archive in a dedicated space on the CalArts campus. We also produced a 400-page publication highlighting posters from the collection with 70 different covers designed by students, faculty, and alumni. The last part of the plan for the archive was to have an exhibition of posters. I worked for a year with MFA students at CalArts to design and curate the exhibition. A few weeks before we were due to begin installing, COVID hit and the show was put on hold. During that time, I was working on an online live event space for CalArts called Thurs.Night. And as the issues surrounding Black Lives Matter came to the fore, it became clear that the larger context of these issues was impossible to ignore. With Thursday night, the curator, Madeleine Falcone, had opened up that space to include other voices, specifically inviting the Black Artist Collective at CalArts to take over the curation of the space for a number of weeks. And this became a model for rethinking this show, Inside Out. We questioned the role of the institution, the archive, and ideas around inclusion and exclusion. During Thursday night, I also reconnected with two graphic design alumni, Tashika Arsenault Sutton and Silas Monroe, and I invited them to create a critical response to the show from the perspective of black designers at CalArts. Hi, I'm Tashika Arsenault Sutton, and I graduated from the MFA in graphic design program at CalArts in 2007. I'm currently an associate professor of graphic design at Southeastern Louisiana University in Hammond, and I live 50 miles south of Hammond in New Orleans, Louisiana, where I was born and raised. I'm Silas Monroe. I'm an alumni of CalArts' MFA in Graphic Design program from 2008. I run a design studio called Polymode, and I also teach at Otis College of Art and Design and advise students at Vermont College of Fine Arts. When Tashika and I were asked to make a critical intervention in the exhibition, we started with thinking about what was missing in the archives. And the intervention eventually was conceived as having multiple parts. So the main part of the exhibition that you feel in the space is a series of texts that weave through the spaces of the posters that Tashika and I both generated. My text is called Unseen Objects and is more in the form of poetry than prose compared to Tashika's text. I do a lot of oscillating between the micro, my experience, and the macro of being a person of color in America and also in the field of design. Going from our written texts to applying those texts into the space of the exhibition was really this experience of dialogue between Tashika and I, 
both in terms of setting typographic voice to each of our texts. Both of us are really drawn to the type design of Josh Darden, who's one of the few black type designers. I used a typeface called Halyard, and she used a typeface called Freight. And part of the process of putting our text into space was different passes of Tashika, who is like an initiator, started the process and kind of blocked out text. And then as me as a bit of a finisher came in and would respond and finesse. One of the most challenging parts of designing the intervention was how to treat the part of my text where I start listing the names of black people that have been murdered at the hands of police or other injustices in the United States. And I'm really grateful to Tashika for taking the lead on this part of typesetting the names. She made the bold decision to set all the names large on one of the walls in the gallery. And I feel like her design decision gave my text permission to take up space and to hold space for those lost. This part of the exhibition really relies on this list of names where we also add our own names at the end as a symbolic gesture to stand in for the vulnerability of being a black person in this country right now. And also our frustration and hope that this changes and needs to change now. When Tashik and I were asked to make this intervention, one of the big questions we were asking was why the two of us, of all the black alumni of CalArts. And so we initially had the idea to create a community around what we were generating. So in addition to our text and the wall intervention, we were thinking back to moments in black cultural life where there was collective creativity. And of course we thought of the Harlem Renaissance and this time when you had poets and artists and designers getting together in these salons, particularly in Alayla Walker's Brownstone in Harlem, where they would have discussions and parties and, and create together. And so Tashika, myself, and Michael organized a series of conversations around themes that were coming out of the exhibition for us. So notions of radicalness in design, uh, ideas of pedagogy and what the future of pedagogy looks like through a lens of a more expansive vision. And then also, where is the black in graphic design at CalArts, which includes conversations with current students and alumni, and begins to create this sense of community that could become more inclusive at CalArts in the future. Sansa and I came up with the idea of having uh, speculative posters. When we were looking through the archive, uh, we know we started really paying attention to not just the design or the formal qualities, but we really were focusing on the actual guests. Like, who are the people that were being brought to campus? And what we realized was that there weren't very many Black people, especially specifically to the graphic de design program, who were being invited to campus. And so we thought that it would be a great idea to sort of evaluate the timeline and come up with people in particular decades who would have been really great people to have on campus to actually have a dialogue and a conversation about their design work. So I think it's in the spirit of CalArts and a graphic design program to kind of think about the what if, you know, like what if this was able to happen? Um, how would that sort of change the, the conversation? One of the things that this exhibition does is reflects the pedagogy of teaching at CalArts. And that pedagogy is really not just about form. It's as much about not just what a student can do, but what they learn from that experience. And those kind of conceptual tools are really about thinking of design as a means of investigating some other topic, of a means of engaging and interrogating that topic. And I feel like that's exactly what this exhibition has done by inviting Silas and Tashika to actually question the role of the archive, 
to question who's being included and who isn't, and what voices are being allowed to become part of history or part of a canon. One of the things that I try to do with teaching is one, try to um, engage my students and have them start to come up with ideas about what they want to learn and what they're interested in learning, um, as opposed to me dictating and telling them what they need to learn or what they should know. So making connections to them, whether it's, you know, most of my students are from rural Louisiana. So trying to find, you know, designers and artists locally that they can sort of make a connection to. Um, another thing that's important important to me um, and how I approach teaching is uh, trying to flatten the hierarchy to where my students don't feel like, you know, I'm, you know, the professor that's sitting up here and they're down here, but I want them to feel included. I want them to feel like that my classroom is a space that they can express themselves authentically and freely. Um, And so the way that I have done that is to set up Uh, collaborations, to have projects where I actually work with my students alongside them so they actually um, feel that connection with me. And I'm not just sort of talking to them about it, but we're actually creating those experiences together. And that has definitely created a lot of confidence in them. One of the key aspects of designing posters when you're a student at CalArts is that there's no critique on the posters, that it's this space of free play and open-ended exploration, which tied to the very rigorous curriculum speaks to a kind of pedagogy of disobedience. And that experience has translated into my practice as a designer since leaving CalArts, but particularly in this exhibition where Tashika and I are literally talking back to the exhibition, we're talking back to our faculty, Michael, and we're also talking back to the institution. And so that philosophy of resistance being a strategy that's part of also this visual play of creating form that is surprising or unexpected or breaks the rules was a huge part of what I got out of being at CalArts. One of the unique aspects of this collaboration was how intimate it was. So the friendship and chosen family experience between Tashika and I, and also with Michael, created this sense of this feeling of how do we have permission to call out our family or call out our community in areas where we feel there needs to be change, particularly around what kind of students have access to the kind of education at CalArts. Tylas and uh, Tashika, uh, what, what was your thought process when conceiving your response to the exhibition? Um, and Tashika, you want to start? Um, for me, um, I felt like the, the way that I had to start, the way that was, um, I would honestly say, easiest for me to start again into it, it was to just kind of reflect on my time at CalArts. And so, um, that became obviously during my essay very personal um, experience for me. Um, I think uh, thinking about the work that I did there, because most of the pro- a lot of the projects that I did had to do with um, black culture and identity. Um, I had to do with uh, a lot of research that I did trying to discover influential uh, black graphic designers, and so all that. Um, just sort of kind of made sense for me to kind of address my actual experience of being a black student in the program there. You describe the experience of being the only black student uh, during your first year of the MFA. Um, And and how during the second and third year, there were some other black students that were accepted into the program and 
And you said in your essay something like, even, even when that happened, we never talk about being black in this program. We never talk about blackness. Um, and I was thinking, yeah, what, what do you think that uh, are the conditions that are necessary to, to, to generate those conversations? And it's, it's very, yeah, it was very curious and interesting to see or these conditions that will allow these conversations to happen. Um, I think in general that the graphic design program um, tends to be very isolated in general from the rest of the school, um, largely. Uh, and in the program, uh, it's very intense. And I think that for the most part, I know for me personally, it had a lot to do with sort of just kind of being focused on what I was doing. And honestly, I, I think at the time, I felt that perhaps I was the only one that was feeling this way. And so it didn't really seem like um, uh, there was a need to go talk to anybody because maybe I'm just the only one that's feeling that way. Maybe everybody else is fine, you know. Um, but I do think that when I think about how this actual um, uh, intervention started, started, it had to do with a lot that was going on. So maybe perhaps if there was something some conversation that was already going on in the school um, that would have perhaps created some space. Maybe if that was um, a uh, black design club or something like that at the school, um, that perhaps would have created the space. But I think just the program is like really intense. And uh, it just did seem like that was, I didn't even think about it, you know? So I guess if something would have actually happened, like. Um, I'm not saying I didn't never had like any type of like racial related incidents, but I think if there was something else kind of going on, then that would have perhaps created a condition or a space to have that conversation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What about you, Salas? Any thoughts about that? Yeah, um, <clears throat> I have a lot of thoughts as well. I, I echo what you're saying about the intensity of the program and sort of the like almost tunnel vision that mm -hmm. the the rigor requires. And it's interesting because Tashika, you were one of the reasons I ended up coming to CalArts. Like we connected during the visit day when I was there. And like in my essay, I talk about, um, I was living on the East Coast at the time and like had a crazy early flight. I remember actually falling asleep like okay. behind your desk. Behind my desk, yes. <laughs> and then we ended up actually, once I came to the program, sitting next to each other. And there was something about the way that you and Jessica Jessica Delena, I had like a moment with the two of you, the way that you were talking about your work that had this sense of uh, specificity about your experience, your identity, your mode of working as a designer. Um, and that was sort of coupled at the same time, like recently I had interviewed at another school <laughs> on the East Coast and the essay also talks about, like I was stopped and frisked in, in New Haven by police, you know, during a visit because I was seen as a suspicious person. And so I think when Michael and you and I reconnected virtually through the events that CalArts was hosting, like all these memories of that sort of inaccessibility feeling of one program and accessibility of CalArts, but then also this loss where we were right next to each other, but never really talked about being black designers and what that meant, especially the few of us that were there. And, and we had other black designers in other programs by that time, both in the BFA and MFA program. And I think part of this also was like, why the two of us to do this? There was a kind of like hesitance and sort of question mark about sort of tokenism, but at the same time, felt like there was an opportunity to speak about our experience as a way to connect to community. And like the ideas for the intervention, we wrote things individually and, and installed them physically in the space, but the, our response was always collective. The idea that what, like, if we could kind of go back in time and have new conversations and, or invite different black designers to CalArts, what would that look like? And so a huge part of the intervention is, is 
the in the space, but it's also the dialogue, the discourse, like these salons, like this conversation right now. Silas, do you think do you think part of it is more about a, a kind of a, an awareness of, of systemic or institutional racism, whereas you know at that time, ten years ago, I think we were thinking about those things on a on an individual and personal level. Um, I mean, it's just interesting to think about. I mean, you make your work as an individual or a person, right? But then it also ends up being in the archive and then it represents you as well. So there's kind of a, a connection between, you know, who you are and the work you make and the things that get left behind as well. Yeah, I think that's true. Like there wasn't the sort of collective awareness um, about systemic racism and, and all kinds of challenges that we're seeing, you know, uh, on their heads, you know, including with the pandemic. Um, I think that's also connected to part, part of one of the assets I think we get in the Khaled's program is this, how to, how to operate as an individual within these systems. So I think there is kind of a focus on one's own position there are collaborations, actually the posters are like one of the things where there's like actual dialogue and exchange quite a bit through the course of study. Like you, it's very common for more than one designer to work on one of those pieces. So, um, but I think when you're working in those, they're sort of devoid of the criticality that you normally sort of think of. So I think when, you know, we'd work on something together, we, we weren't bringing sort of that agenda of like, let's address a systemic uh, problem, right? It was more about like, let's make something really beautiful and unexpected and um, in the moment. But that, that makes me think of something that I think your, your essay, Silas, Unseen Objects, uh, a point that your essay touches, which is this sort of legacy of graphic design of being a discipline that doesn't allow the social to, to change it in some way. There's something like, um, you, you talk about the handshake of American European high modernism and, and this idea of autonomy in some way. It's something that, uh, that uh, like, not to talk about myself, but I come from South America and in, in my the public university I went to, there are many, many posters, but they are all political, ugly posters with, you know, talking about politics. They, uh, and it was surprising to me at Calars to be in a space where the posters were all so beautiful and perfectly designed. Um, so I'm thinking if, if something that, um, there's something of what you're talking about uh, in your essay as well, that is this, how do we change the, the discipline? How do we change not only the institutions, but there's something, there's like a dragging of, of systemic racism or, or mm. even um, um, exclusionary ways of thinking that are inside the disciplines. Um, I'm thinking of the, yeah, I'm thinking also of this, um, in your essay, you collage sort of like scenes that go from the macro and, and systemic and, and, and to, the, to the very, like very, very specific scenes. So you are like linking or bridging these situations uh, um, from like the sense of self and subjectivity link with broader systems and the discipline of graphic design as well. I remember, uh, uh, that phrase where you say, imagine a world, a world in which Paul Rand was black. Can you, can you talk about a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. I, I don't know. I feel like this might be a good time to read like yeah, of part course. of that pa passage. Um, the, the passage that I was, I'm going to read doesn't have the Paul Rand part, but it does speak to the European American high modernism. And it does have that kind of like macro micro part of it and then I can kind of expand on what you're asking. Black is the color of the pigment and the placa imported from Switzerland. It's also the melanin in the skin of W.E.B. Du Bois. Black is a swatch of enamel painted on the steel frame of the Eames house. Black is a tint that's not printed in the history books of graphic design, except for a token here or there 
an inadequate symbolic gesture of acknowledgement, a drop of color in the asterisk in the footnotes of the index of your archive. Black is the color of bodies brutally murdered in cold blood for all to witness, murdered by those who are supposed to protect us. Bodies like mine, faces like mine. And here you come to ask me to educate you on fragility management, triage because you can't seem to grasp my own rage that you try to manage. Charge me with the responsibility of the plantation, but pay me only wages to pick the cotton. Ask me to earn the accolades that your cronies have pre-selected or more likely rejected by the not so secret handshake that says European American high modernism. And so like reading that again, I'm really thinking about sort of the, the gaps and, and, and what's missing in the discipline. And then also I think the paradox of, of wanting to change that or making attempts to change that. And I think to Michael's point about sort of individuality, there's like this responsibility, I think that she, you probably share this, where you feel like you need to move the needle yourself or you feel yes. kind of responsible, Possible. right? And, and then also uh, you feel like wholly inadequate or unequipped to really do the change that's needed, which is, is really a, a collective effort. But I, th I think it goes back to Carmen's comments. Um, yeah, I think the reason why I feel that burden is because there's so few you know, visible black graphic designers, right? So it does, it does put that burden on you right? Because there's, you can't push it off and say, well, somebody else is going to do this because there isn't that many other people. And the only way that that is going to change is by having role models, by having these discussions, by actually um, trying to point out the inadequacies of, of the profession in a way. Um, I, I think it's, un, it, 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 it's, I mean, it is a burden, but it's also a kind of unavoidable one. Um, right. You know, one thing I was thinking about is how, um, you know, in a way the archive shows, it shows what's missing, right? So you have to kind of, and, it, and that doesn't mean you can go back and fix it, right? Because I think when we look at the archive, you can look at it and go, okay, well, there's you know, a fairly good balance between say male and female designers. But if you look, there's not a lot of, you know, Lat Latino designers, right? There's not a lot of black designers. But we can't go back and fix that in time. You can't magically put that into an archive because it wasn't there. You know, it was, there was only a few students. But so that, what that implies by looking at the archive is how do we fix the system, right? It's actually the, the system that will then have an impact back on the future archive. Yeah, and I think um, that's why sort of, um, even if you don't want to be, you know, the token, you don't want to be, to start a face of black graphic designers, um, for a moment you kind of have to be to a certain degree because it's better to acknowledge that and make yourself kind of known who you are and what you do and um, make black voices known as opposed to sort of hide behind it and just say, I just want to be known for being a good designer, which is true. And I think most people of color um, want to be known for um, their skill set, right? Not to be, oh, you're good to be this, right? It's like telling a black woman, oh, you're good, you know, you're pretty to be dark skinned or something, right? Yeah. So, but when it comes to this, it's like, well, if I, I have to acknowledge and embrace that I am a black woman and I'm a designer, as opposed to sort of um, making that invisible or not acknowledging it, because like what Michael said, you don't have that many out there. So somebody has to be known, somebody has to speak up somebody you have to be the one but it's also that pressure off if you're the first one or the only one you know there is that sort of burden you know that you carry you talk about the the necessity or the lack of role models uh, in your essay uh i don't know if you want to read that um final paragraph i think that that's the one you, you selected to those five black students, I regret not asking them if they shared the same feelings of isolation and lack of confidence as I, as I did. 
if they exhibited insecurities that negatively affected their work. I never asked them if they ever felt embarrassed or frustrated by not being able to name one black person who made a significant contribution to the graphic design canon. I never asked them if, they lack, if the lack of role models left them feeling trapped in a strategy of imitating an aesthetic of people who were culturally, socially, and economically different from them. Maybe they didn't feel trapped in that way, but I did. I always felt good and confident in my knowledge about Black history, Black culture, and Black identity. I struggled to find my voice. Not knowing or having any knowledge about Black designers left me feeling voiceless. The problem was, for me, I think um, part of the reason why I didn't reach out to Silas, who um, came into the program a year after the, or the reason I didn't reach out to Cameron Ewing, who became one of my classmates in my second year is because I think there was this sort of sense of embarrassment, to be honest. I was right. so confident in my knowledge in all other areas of Black history and Black culture, well versed in Black literature and Black history and, you know, felt good about like my identity, but it was embarrassing for me to, once it um, became a re reality, that I did not know any Black people you know, in the history of graphic design who, you know, I didn't learn about it. I didn't read about it. Um, and, and, and I think maybe somewhere I thought maybe some people or somebody else knew something that I didn't. And so I think it was embarrassing to like maybe admit to that. Um, and then being at CalArts, you know, you, you know, you think you're like, oh, you're at this private art school and you're surrounded by all these really smart and talented people. And so to sort of admit that you didn't know something about your own mm -hmm. something you want to admit right because you're amongst the sort of you know best and the brightest you know in the field and so you don't want to sort of to show that that type of vulnerability to be honest yeah it's a shock to the system right like yeah because there was such an evolution and skill and and knowledge uh acquisition skill development in all these other areas but then you kind of realize like your own lineage is either erased <laughs> invisible or you don't know it which is like right. that's like how do you not know yourself which is like i feel like so much of what the pedagogy of cal arts was like self-actualization self-alignment and like the idiosync idiosyncratic right, right? understanding yeah. of oneself so it's like it's like you don't have a mother's tongue or something like that yeah. Well, I think that's something that we are coming to understand now is the power of institutions and how institutions get ingrained in our subjectivities and sense of, of self and who we are. It's very, very confusing. And uh, I think that having these conversations is, is something that is fundamental to start understanding those dynamics. Um, I wanted to ask you, um, to ask both of you, what were the, or what was the decision making process or the, um, the process of moving from the essays to the wall text installation in the gallery? Um, how did you guys work together in using your essays as materials for the installation? So we started obviously with conversations, right? And I think um, because of what I just read in my essay, this I, the, the fact that Salas and I never addressed, like we never had this dialogue, we never had this conversation, we never addressed, you know, um, anything dealing with being black in this field, you know, in this particular profession. And so I know the one thing that we, we talked about, we wanted to do was, Although we both worked on our essays individually, we did want to sort of create this idea of a dialogue where the essays were sort of not only sort of talking and speaking to the dialogue, but we were also kind of speaking and having a dialogue with each other in that mm. space. Yeah, I feel like that was such a gift. I mean, Tashika and I have had good fortune of being colleagues at BCFA. When I was a chair, um, she was one of the faculty that I asked to to join there and I, I'm actually still like I have chills thinking about your presentation 
there, which was centered around the research you were doing and sort of, and asking that question, like, where's, where's the black graphic design? <laughs> like, where is it? Um, which is a question we keep asking <laughs> today. Still asking. Yeah, right. And um, like, I knew you were doing that research, but it, it blew my mind. It, it really moved people. I think that was, what was that, Tashika 2011 or something yeah. like that? that? And so I think coming back together again and, and thinking about how the text would live in the space together, that we wanted there to be the typographic and visual expression of a dialogue. And it also felt like we gave each other permission. Tashika, typical to form, started writing first <laughs> <laughs> and like sent me basically her draft kind of came together like kind of full form because I think you had that sort of language down already in your writing and I I suddenly something came out of me and I like wrote and I sent a partial version to Tashika like you know late at night and she was just basically like keep going keep going and so that exchange translated into the design like we were both sort of responding. Uh, we both chose type from Joshua Darden, who's one of the few black type designers. Uh, that's changing now, but like that was a critical point. And there was a lot of like passing it back and forth. As far as the process, I think how we sort of started with the design just kind of worked to Later, I mean, kind of after the timeline was finished, me and Silas realized that how we started that kind of worked with our personality and our just our regular process of designing. So I kind of started first, right, where I just kind of just went in there and um, I think I tackled like the first two walls first. And then um, Silas being more of a finisher and a finesser, um, he said he has a hard time maybe like getting started. So he sort of like went back in there and tweaked. And then there were moments where, um, cause we kind of had like a separate file and I went back and um, it was just kind of interesting to kind of see like, you know, there were parts and certain words and things that maybe he said that I wanted to highlight it and kind of bring to the forefront. But then maybe I silenced my voice a little bit, but then he, mm -hmm. he went back into it and maybe there were certain parts of my essay um, that he really liked and he wanted to sort of like um, kind of highlight it. So it was really a true um, kind of collaboration and kind of like back and forth um, in the process that just kind of happened actually really organically. I think there's also something really nice about the, the fact that the, the text is, you know, put into a visual form and broken up into sections. So it becomes very much like a discussion between the two of you. But there's also kind of slippage at times where you mm -hmm. don't know whose voice He's is talking. what and then the text is always recont recontextualized by whatever posters are sitting alongside it yes. through this different timeline and I, I mean for me the overall effect of it ends up being well okay this is this is you you know Tashika talking about these very personal issues at this time Silas kind of addressing these more global issues but when you view them alongside the timeline it feels like well it hasn't really changed it probably hasn't changed since 1970 you know and, and there's <laughs> And I, I think that's a kind of, as, a, as a, a, a kind of overall commentary on, you know, I mean, not just the archive, but I think on, you know, private, edu private design, edu on design education, but especially private design education with the expense that's, you know, connected to that. Um, I felt like that's something that made a, a sort of more powerful overall point. Yeah, I agree with that too. The, the sort of like cycles of time that we're experiencing and, and the repetitiveness of it, um, and that sort of frustration, and then also re-exertion and, and pain, you know, just the like emotions of it, which I think all of us were carrying. Um, one thing that I did want to sort of speak to was like also the dialogue between Tashik and I and Michael and Carmen, and like actually starting to put our language in that space and, and as being like alumni and like knowing some of the designers that had made some of the posters, whether we were like in school with them or they were an influence or po certain posters that like we had seen in the archive that had a kind of mythos to them. I think there was this tension between like 
the anger and like frustration talking back to this context, but then also feeling like um, family in a, in a way. And um, this interesting exchange of both like collaborating, but also having this mentorship history, you know, and well, family, yeah. you're, you're allowed to be lovingly critical, <laughs> right? You don't stop being part of the family, but you sure have. You, you, you're allowed to criticize. You're allowed to say things that you wouldn't maybe, you know, say to strangers. Um, I think that's quite kind of endearing about the whole thing. In the conversation when we first started about talking about the intervention and the possibility of having um, like other activities, Salas and I. Um, didn't want it to be just our voices or just our black voices a part of the intervention. So we started brainstorming and uh, we're thinking about what other ways could we sort of involve or invite um, other alum, other alumni, uh, current students, you know, maybe faculty um, to be involved. And so um, we thought it would be a good idea to document the process. So having a, a website as a component, as a way to share the essays, um, have interviews with uh, previous Pellar students uh, and current students, uh, interviews, uh, speculative posters for Black uh, artists and designers we felt like who have, who should have been perhaps invited to campus so students could have the opportunity to make posters for. So um, we invited and asked other uh, alumni and students to be involved in our process as well. Yeah, and I feel like that because our, the conversation was a kind of like healing balm and like a currency between us. Um, we were also sort of thinking about other moments in Black history and, and Black excellence where the conversation was as important as each individual's output as a creative person. And that made us think, of course, of the Harlem Renaissance and this idea of us like the salons and Alayla Walker's um, 156th Street Brownstone in Harlem and then um, Georgia Douglas Smith's um, residence in DC as these like focal points of where, you know, Langston Hughes and Zora Neale Hurston and you know Aaron Douglas and like all these sort of black creators met and um, sopped and like connected and and boosted and, and nourished each other and so this is the first of a series of other conversations you know that are connected to the themes of the exhibition from pedagogy to that question where is the black in graphic design at CalArts, which will have um, alumni and current students, um, and and we're hoping also um, past faculty, but we're we're sort of still working on that. But that that cross section of conversation to me has so much value, almost as much as like the the pieces of design is is sort of the conversations that could lead to real change. You guys start sort of creating a counter archive. You, you, are, you are creating the archive of the, of the future in the sense that, I mean, one component of, of this intervention is also to compile all these productive conversations and posters and activities and put them together in a publication. So it, it's very interesting to me, again, like thinking about the temporalities, it's like we are celebrating the culmination of the Colors poster archive that finally got digitized and it's online and it's available to the public. But this is also the starting point of something new. And um, I think that's really exciting. I think that as a, as a Colors alumni myself, there's no better way to celebrate the institution than radically criticizing it in a, in a productive way. Yeah, we have like a, around five minutes. Can I say um, one, yeah. one, one other thing that I think is important is that, you know, this, the idea is that, you know, you have this website, right? And we're going to, you're going to get contributions. All of this process will eventually lead to another publication with the idea that it's a kind of companion piece to the book uh, that we published of, of the poster archive. And um, I think one of the things that brings it full circle is another of the starting points was actually Sarah Godestina wrote an essay for that book 
and I didn't know this at the time, but had asked Silas to kind of look at the essay when she was working on it. And that essay kind of re-envisions the archive from, uh, you know, an LGBTQ kind of perspective and, and a more radical kind of perspective and imagining. Yeah, and a lot of the questions that she was asking, I think, were also really important and, and drove a lot of this conversation as well. I just wanted to kind of acknowledge that, that uh, the importance of that piece of writing as well. You guys yeah. all became educators. So uh, I was curious to know how, how you see from, from where you are uh, um, the future of graphic design education. How do you think or see that social media is changing it? If like social media is something that is amplifying all the goods and evils of this time from like collectivity uh, towards like extreme individualism and celebrity culture. So um, what are some of the questions that you think we should be asking the discipline and specifically what are some of the questions that graphic design educators should be addressing right now? Well, I feel like your question ties to what Michael was saying about Sarah's essay. And I, I would just want to echo that, that um, text is really powerful and in her interrogation, not only of like what's in the archive, but sort of the, the teaching conversations around how the archive was created. And I think she's asking a lot of questions. I, she doesn't say this in her essay, but I use this term pedagogical damage. And I think every teacher and student has it, including our teachers as well. And sort of um, how, do you, how do you contend with these sort of like personal question marks uh, of your own experience and sort of what the discipline is asking? And I think one of the kind of amazing things about the framework that I felt like I was given particularly Kellerts is like this ability to make with a question and to sort of, and that includes your pedagogy, including what you create in the classroom. And I think there's um, kind of an amazing dialogue that had already been brewing, but it's just been heightened in the last six months or so around like questioning design's role, not only in how it should be taught, who, who should get access to it, but also uh, design as a as a tool or as, as in the fabric of the systems of political upheaval of communication. If you think about social media, if you think of a protest, like graphic design is there, like through all of it, right? Mm -hmm. As a thing that we can we can make visible the systems that need to change. I, I think there's also like a weird thing about being an educator is that you know you're you're stuck in a time loop, right? And you feel like you're almost doing the same things over and over again. So your change is not, is not always just about what you do, it's what your students do. So like in a way I feel like, okay, so like I had a hand in Silas and Tashika's education and then they'll have a hand in somebody else's education and they'll have a hand in somebody else's education. And th that pedagogy doesn't remain the same as it gets filtered through those people. But I think if you can kind of have that uh, like energy, enthusiasm and that, that, you know, that sense of trying to get, you know, a, not just, having everybody turn out the factory the same. I think that that's, that's like the key thing. Well, you're pointing at graphic design as an industry or working as an, for an industry and, and like graphic design is a discipline that is completely enmeshed in capitalism, right? So I, I, I think that, yeah, it's really, it's really complicated. I mean, uh, it is totally enmeshed in capitalism, but the whole point of the posters, for instance, like these visiting artist posters, is that they're, they're removed from that from their their kind of functional context, right? The, the 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 immediacy of reading about an event, like that's that's out the window. These are about the designer's personal agendas. They're about formal experimentation. So in that way, that as a body of work, they're already against the system in a way. Um, you know, they're kind of counter to how the design is meant to work in a lot of ways. Yeah, I mean, the fact that we didn't have to get those posters critiqued by Michael, I mean. <laughs> 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 that in and of itself made it so much more freeing, you know. 
but it also counters the idea of the construct of the critique, right? And so this sort of critique is removed, you know, from the, from the process in a sense. And the critique sort of comes in, you know, one thing that I love about doing the posters at Colars is sort of the critique is if your poster gets basically taken off the wall, right? So if your poster is <laughs> still there after the lecture, that's sort of your critique, you know, or maybe that wasn't, you know, it wasn't the best person <laughs> still hanging around. So I think in that it sort of even turns itself on its head in that way. And so um, that's just another dif different type of um, kind of teaching to, and um, I guess uh, kind of sense of agency too, that you're giving um, the student to kind of have those little small moments, right? Where they can just kind of do work and not have to worry about it being looked at, um, you know, in a, in a classroom or whatever, right? And so that's something that I think about. It's like, when are the moments, where are the spaces where um, with teaching, where that hierarchy can kind of get flattened a little bit more, right? Where students feel that they have that voice, right? That they have the, mm. Um, that kind of space to kind of be free and not have to worry about being critiqued, right? So I think that's part of the future is the sort of flattening of it, mm. right? Where the students um, kind of feel, they're not worried about sort of making something for the teacher, right? They're not worried oh, yeah. about kind of fulfilling their needs, right? Because mm -hmm. for some, you know, it's like, yeah, you teach and your students become your little minions. And it's like, but do we really want that? that's not really progress, right? We want them to be able to kind of think for themselves and feel confidence in their own voice. That, that's making me think of the zine your students recently finished. Can you just talk about that? Because I feel like that's a perfect example of what Carmen is asking about the future of education, but also like the discipline itself. Yeah, well, um, because of my, my research and my interest and sort of highlighting uh, Black designers who have made contributions to the field of design um, historically that are sort of untold, these untold stories. I, I wrote a grant at my university uh, to get some funds. So I had this idea that I wanted my students to sort of create a, a chapter or a section with sort of the idea, because it's called the missing chapter, um, where they each had to kind of do research on a, either a Black designer a black um, design studio or a black publication, and they each were tasked to to write and design a spread in the publication. And so um, we designed it collectively. Um, we worked together to talk about like you know like just general design stuff like color and paper. So they were completely involved in the process. It wasn't me telling them what they had to do. The only instructions that they had from me was you have to use Joshua's Darden Sprite, basically. And that was kind of <laughs> it. And so I think because I let them basically do whatever they want, they chose who they wanted to research. They did the writing, they did the layout. That wasn't a grid necessarily. I didn't even give them that. I just gave them a format and the size that fit within our budget. And um, it was actually some of the most, I guess, freeing work that they did. But for me, I think that was the, you know, um, I think that is sort of how we, you know, can move forward. Where we're giving the students, we're having them sort of do the work, and they are in control of what they're learning, right? They they sort of have the, um, they're creating their own spaces to decide what they want to learn and what they uh, want to investigate, what they're interested in. I look forward to. Uh really listening to the, the salons you're putting together are incredible. And I think that a lot of these questions are going to be readdressed uh, through the public programming. Thank you, everyone. And uh, thank you uh, to our speakers. Um, this has been great. And thank you all for participating. Um, please don't forget to visit our website, redcat.org. You can also find uh, on the website the essays and uh, the virtual tour. So um, also please sign up to our newsletter so we can keep you updated on our programs. Uh, 
And again, if you want to support programs like this, please consider making a donation at redcat.org slash support. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Tashika. Thank you, Silas. And I hope to see you all next time.